Thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you like what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. And uh, today we get to welcome author Tim Hendricks uh, to the program. Tim is a former U.S. Army captain. Who, uh, who served as a tank platoon leader as well as a military intelligence officer. And uh, before I even kind of go on with that, in terms of being the author and stuff, you've crafted one of my favorite protagonists in the last couple of years, oh, wow. uh, Derek Thank Harrington, uh, which is in your first debut novel, The Instructor. Mm -hmm. um, I know the sequel is coming up later in the spring. Um, but before we kind of get into that, welcome to the show. And uh, just tell me about how you kind of fell into the whole the uh, the whole writing process. Sure, that's awesome. Uh, th thank you for that great intro, by the way. You know, anytime somebody starts by saying one of your favorite protagonists of uh, the last few years, that's that's a huge compliment. It's tough that's to create a, those too in this day and age. It's you know, it's um especially like writing in the thrower space, but then also uh, the military thrower space in particular. Um, you can get a lot of kind of cookie cutter guys you know and and it feels like every single protagonist these days is the um ex special forces ex special operations kind of guy and i get that that's fine and everything but i wanted to really make derek a little bit more um closer to the civilian side of things you know someone who's been removed from that community a little bit um you know isn't a globe trotting super spy like the gray man or anything like that right. um you know someone a little more tangible down to earth um also wanted him a little later in years you know in in his post-military career so he's he's not this young buck that's out there you know able to recover from injuries within 30 seconds like no he he <laughs> he needs a massage and a beer at the end of the day you know that kind of thing so um so so again thank you for that and uh you know to answer your question i've just been i've been writing since i was a kid um really started in junior high like putting stories down um pencil to paper some of it was um teacher inspired with the uh, assignments but a lot of it was just my imagination you know my, my just constant need to create stories and and we you know weave these tales that uh were just full of massive clashes of armies and dragons and monsters. And, um, you know, the opening sequence of the predator comes to mind with these yeah. huge, huge gunfights and explosions and everything. It's just, it's just kind of the way my mind always was as a kid. And, um, you know, as I grew up and realized I can't be playing with GI Joes the rest of my life. If I ever want to get a girlfriend, you know, I, that kind of like, slowly transitioned from you know the action figure side of my imagination to putting those stories down on paper and then it just took off from there I just always kept it as a hobby and uh eventually the hobby became kind of a goal and then the goal became a reality it's uh the writing in high school and college for me was very um you, you had to do it because you had to pass the class right or you right. had to mm -hmm. assign it but i had so much it kind of to your point, I mean, I growing up, the first R-rated movies I've ever saw were Predator and Robocop. So I've always yeah. been attached to that type of action, violence, hero, damsel distress type action. But when it came to my writing and stuff, I thrived in creating stories with like the whole fantasy type of idea. Everything from combining our Western front and Johnny Tremaine to Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia. So it's like that that mm -hmm. action steeped in honesty. It, even though it could be a fantasy world and completely bullshit, not even possible with dragons, sure. it's still the still the the, the uh, same principles and ideas in those stories. Um, I just loved it. I was like, I just went down this rabbit hole where you, get, you go through college, and then I do all my government stuff and the Secret Service, and all the books I'm reading there, nomenclatures, ammunition, like all this stuff that sure you have to do it, but I hate it. <laughs> it wasn't until the pandemic where you sit at home, but I I realized. All these years, I didn't do as much reading as I should have. Right. And I just fell in love with the whole thriller and the whole action. And this brought me back to my youth again, where mm -hmm. I could see other people who obviously care about their craft and what they write about. That kind of resonates with people like me that miss those times of my youth and grade school where you actually got to read and do all that stuff. 
Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I'm, I'm with you on the reading part because I, I started with this goal of um, writing in the fantasy genre and, and trying to do like the world building everything there. And I still have several of those projects on the shelf that I work on from time to time. Um, but I, landed my agent through the instructor manuscript and it was just on like a whim that I decided to venture into the thriller space. I, I never wanted to write in like our contemporary world. Cause I always thought it was more difficult that way. Um, you know, the, the idea that um, I had to abide by the rules of our reality was something I was like, no, that's too hard. And, well, because then... readers have this, this <laughs> conception that if it's in this world, it has to abide by our rules. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and so I was like, no, I want to create my own worlds because I can do whatever I want then. And um, didn't realize how incredibly hard that can be. Uh, and so, you know, I just took a stab at, at writing this um, this manuscript. And I remember getting on the call with my uh, future agent, uh, Barbara Powell, and she's like, you know, well, who else have you read in the thrower space? And like, I panicked because like the Tom last, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like Tom Clancy, Robert Ludlow. Jack Carr. Uh, she's like, uh, yeah. I hadn't even heard of Jack Carr yet. I hadn't know any of them. She's like, have you read Nick Petrie? Have you read Don Bentley? No, have you read Jack Carr? Have you read, uh, you know, uh, Mark Rainey? I was like, uh, no. And so I actually got, um, as part of that call, we did like a revise and resubmit of the manuscript, but she also gave me a homework assignment where I had in like three days, I had to read, uh, not three days, 30 days. I had to read three thriller novels, uh, in that time frame on top of editing the manuscript, um, to see, you know, to kind of coincide with the edits that she was talking about and get me a better feel for the genre. Uh, and ever since then, I, you know, my eyes have been open and I've been like voraciously reading all my colleagues' uh, work and whatnot. So, what was the big difference that when she told you to read those three books and after you read them and went back and do the edits, what would, did you notice your writing? What part of your writing changed in the sense of did not necessarily fit what those authors are doing per se? Was she more like, hey, if you want to be successful in the thriller genre, adhere to these type of steps that or things that these authors who are successful are doing? Yeah, I, I think that's that's largely what the biggest um, critique was of the manuscript when we first uh, got on the call with one another. It was just the, the overall structure of the book because I didn't have that kind of baseline knowledge of how a thriller should be paced and how right. it should be organized. You know, there was a scene at the, at the very end that should have been in the beginning and that kind of thing. So she was like, read these books to get a feel for how you can reorganize what you have here. You know, to her credit, she, she read the manuscript and said, you, you're good, but you're, you're not there yet because you're way off base with how you've uh, pieced this thing together. And uh, I took that that guidance to heart and started reading that. And then there were just, you know, there's the tropes that you need yeah. in every thriller. You know, you need a significant twist or two in there. You need action. You need to, you know, throw, hook people right from the beginning and kind of climax a little bit with your, yeah. your action scenes. But you can't go too high. You got to bring it back down. And then you got to build it again to like the big scene. So... It was uh, an education for sure uh, in, in all of that. And um, I think that was the biggest change from beginning to end was not necessarily having to rewrite the whole manuscript, but having to reorganize the whole manus manuscript and put it in a way that would flow to the point where she could actually sell it to, to a publisher. And then I had like just cliche things that i did as a new writer yeah of course you know, you know like the the angry ex-wife with with a, a a fake breast enhancement job and she's like yeah no that's yeah maybe like... stuff like that though for me it's like it makes it it kind of grounds at a level like every guy goes or every person can have that person in their life and it kind of makes it like sure. relatable. yeah yeah um when it comes to like the when you go through the manuscript and getting to the point where you got the publisher tour and all these, the book comes out at what point during that kind of reworking of what you initially put together, did you realize that someone like Derek 
could be in another book, a third book, a fourth book, or this is how, like, how do you know, did you start this process knowing that this would be a couple of books or did you want to end this in a way where like the first Rambo, first blood, where due to the success of it, movies and shit, they resurrected them and they changed the ending. But does that ever come across your mind that way? Uh, yeah, yes and no. I think a little bit of both. Um, I, I tend to write long-winded um as you might have noticed just from my answers i tend to speak long-winded as well so um i i do not not so much in the particular like paragraph to paragraph writing it, it can be succinct and and very um to the point in the writing but in terms of the elongated story that i'm trying to tell it can be several books worth you know so i i kind of always couch things in the in the frame of okay is this going to be three books is it going to be four books or whatnot right. so this this particular storyline i set out with derek knowing that it would be at least a four book series just to finish this first storyline yeah um and from there i started getting the idea of like okay once the storyline is over, where can we go with the world that's been created? You know, Derek is certainly going to be, I don't know, something like 45, 46 years old by the time this storyline wraps up because the book takes place over the span of like four years or so or, or the story over the span of right. four, year, four years, four or five years. So I'm like, what new adventures can I throw him in being a 46, four, you know, uh, 45 46 yeah, year old dude believable. right that's believable and you know certainly he sustains his fair share of wounds and and scars yeah. in the series so it's like okay come on is this guy superman or what you know but there's other things that you can do not necessarily making him the forefront per se you know you can spin off two side characters uh in the sequel there's a uh, interesting uh, couple uh, that are um, two of my favorite characters that I've written so far named uh, Maureen and Al, who I, I borrowed from some friends. Um, so th there's your 15 minutes, Maureen and Al. Um, <laughs> but, but um, they're essentially retired uh, CIA husband and wife uh, that met at the, at the farm um, is it the farm or the barn. I always get those two confused. What's farm, you, right? I think it's the farm, what yeah. they call the CIA yeah. um, clandestine training grounds or whatever. So, yeah. but they meet there. And um, I thought it would be so much fun to like spin off them into like a Vietnam era spy novel, you know, it, yeah. just as a, as like kind of a prequel. So there's different things that you can do. Um, but I'm always writing in that mindset of of multiple books and and multiple series it's just kind of the way my stories end up being like i don't want to give away too much obviously because people haven't read the book yet when this episode drops or gonna want to get the sequel and i can say now that your this book is actually going to be in the second box of the book club awesome. for talk and uh one of the reasons why i love like a series like john wick is that Sure, the action, everything, he gets his ass kicked, he gets shot, he gets stabbed, loses body parts. Yeah. But everything, there's no a scene or a character or a movement. Nothing's wasted. And right. when I was reading your book, it felt like this, kind of what you just said, that everything has a purpose. Right. It's not just a throwaway. Every character that somebody like Derek comes across, the back of my mind, I'm like, well, he might see this person again or might need this person again, whether it's a good way or a bad way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of cool how you're able to kind of like harness that type of like energy in terms of like the world building itself. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, growing up, we, uh, we didn't have cable TV. Uh, so we were a big movie family. I say this a lot. My, my older brother worked at the local library and they had a VHS movie section and he would come home every shift with two new movies for us. And I mean, like we would wear out the tapes. I think we had like, in our possession at the house, we had like Back to the Future, Batman, the Michael Keaton Batman. That's yep. how old I am. And Die Hard. And we would just like religiously watch those and wear them out. And this is like back in the day where you could like record oh, yeah. movies off of TV, yeah. but you had to like pause it. And all that. Yeah. yeah. And, and you would pause it during the commercials so that it wouldn't, you know, <laughs> so a, a four hour movie wouldn't uh, or a two hour movie wouldn't be four hours worth of tape. Um, and so I, I, 
think that really went a long way to telling stories cinematically uh, in that, which can be done both good and bad. You know, we all know that there's some real crap storytelling out there in, in Hollywood, but for a good story, um, you can't have that wasted effort. You know, you can't have those spinoffs that never get resolved because people come out of the movie theater and they're saying like, what, what was that whole thing with the book that the guy was reading? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why did they even include that? And literally, you know, later on I learned like, Oh, well editing, you know, they, you know, sometimes how the editors put things together after the fact makes that happen. But as a writer, you have the ability to, uh, control that you know so if you're putting things in there and you're going to read your manuscript 70 times before it finally goes to to print um i think you have to you know do the due diligence to make sure that any little tidbit that you've put in there you're closing the loop uh whether it's with it, and it doesn't have to be in the same book you know right. there's there's loops that i leave open in my stories, but I know that they're going to get closed later on down the road, which is right. the fun of it because I'm the author and people are the readers. So they don't know what's coming yet. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're that kind of, uh, especially in the thriller genre, like people want pace, right? They want, they want fast. They want action delivered. They want um a story that's intriguing, but not overly complicated. Right. So if right. you're putting in fluff passages, you're wasting people's time. You, you waste people's time and you're going to get people to turn off. You know, some people you look at online reviews, they say, Oh, I couldn't get past page 50. I'm like, really? Page right. 50? Like, you know, 50 words where it gets not good. I'm like, there's yeah. 300 more pages, you know, <laughs> like give it a shot, you know, he's right. giving even, even triple digits, but um, so, so yeah, between all that, watching those movies, um, reading the books, seeing how lean, uh, a story needs to be really kind of cultivated that idea of, um, everything needs to, to be plausible and, and, right. and finalized. So you're not leaving those plot holes out there that just, you know, people, people will pick up on them. Be like, right. You know, what, what was the point of this jet ski? Like, <laughs> shoot <laughs> I forgot I forgot about that you know <laughs> right with Derek being a survivalist bushcraft expert fieldcraft and I've had those guests on the show mm -hmm. um I, I just I love that I've, yeah watch real TV survivor like all that outdoors channel alone sure. whatever it's, it's awesome but how's that I was curious with your background living in a tank in the military uh mm -hmm. with Derek being a seer program guy and like all this type of survival stuff was it difficult to create a military former military guy that wasn't necessarily per se with your background? Like what research went into that? Like, how did you kind of put that together? Yeah. Um, it, it was, it, it, yes, yes, it was difficult. Uh, <laughs> first and foremost is the fact that I wrote Derek as a Marine, uh, and I'm former army, army. Yeah. and everybody thinks we speak the language, <laughs> the same language, but we don't, um, or better put, we speak the same same language, but you can't understand how the Marines are pronouncing it. You know, so um, this is a shot uh, a shot at my my leatherneck friends out there, but whatever. <laughs> um, it's all in good fun. Uh, it, basically, so something so simple as like there's a scene in the instructor where he's describing uh, the way his elderly father still makes his bed, right, and. I know what the measurements were for the folds between the top of the mattress to the blanket and how long the blanket has to be doubled over. I knew what those were in the army, but that took me two and a half hours to research from the Marine Corps standpoint, right. just to make sure they were the same thing because the last absolute I, authenticity is huge for me. And the last thing I need is a Marine saying you, you got the, the bed rack measurements wrong because then everything goes out the window like oh he, he couldn't be the attention bothered. details not here doesn't respect us enough 100 percent, right yeah. so it starts there and that attention to detail uh that that need that drive for authenticity drives my research now i i was a history major in college so um luckily research comes easy to me and it's good and uh 
at the same time, I had a primary source um, individual, good friend of mine, Rob, who has his own wilderness survival school. Um, So I could lean on him. um, You know, I would ask, hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? And he would give me um, just just little things that would make you think I was the expert because I wrote them and incorporated them in. But in reality, the knowledge was coming from Rob. I was just using enough of it to be convincing in the story that uh, I had done the research and knew what I was talking about. Um, But yeah, a whole bunch of stuff from writing from an army perspective into a Marine's perspective writing from a non-survival guy into a guy who actually has a survival school and has been through seer school like a a large part of the seer school stuff i you know i researched it but the sources out there are kind of like purposely vague on seer school sometimes so a a good portion of that is imagination and you know um pretty accurate assumptions as to what happens and whatnot but uh yeah, it, it was a it was a heavy task of, of researching it to make sure that I was nailing all of that detail down to the point where uh, the veteran bucket isn't going to say this guy's full of shit and the yeah, Marines yeah. are going to say this guy doesn't always talk about and the survivalists and the outdoors people are going to be like, no, that would never happen, you know. So I had a lot of a lot of bases to cover with this one. Yeah, for sure. Was the with the obviously with your Intel background. In terms of like books like this, maybe the sequel and stuff, the process, you have to be careful, obviously, saying like kind of what you did in terms of this world. So what kind of process do you have to go through to get cleared to possibly talk about a certain tactic or something that you might have used or do use in your former career? Yeah, um, certainly there was um, there is a process for that. Uh, and. I didn't go through it because I wrote the book specifically knowing that the stuff that I was using was public consumption. It was was declassified info. Um, But I do know um, individuals like Jack Carr, they have to go through an extensive like review through the Pentagon. There's like a Pentagon publishing um, uh, department that that basically reads your manuscript and will um you know do the redactions the black lines even in yeah. the final printed version you know they'll have the redactions and there's something to be said for what i understand sometimes the stuff that gets redacted is publicly available on online anyway but you know right i don't go down that route because i never really touch anything that is um classified to begin with right you know, my, my you know I, I make a, a remark about him teaching uh, ROTC level tactics, you know, and I yep. always poke, poke fun at ROTC cause I was, I was an ROTC cadet um, on my path to commissioning. But I, I said like, you know, Oh, go up there and, and teach him ROTC level tactics. And they'll think that they're, you know, Chuck Norris or something like yep. that. They'll, they'll think they're, they're seal team six because they don't know any better. So th- that's kind of like the premise that I use right. when approaching this stuff because you know, I don't want to end up in Leavenworth because I'm <laughs> Yeah, correct. <laughs> I'm I'm, I'm kind of right, man. Yeah, you know, I'm just I don't want to be divulging uh trade secrets out there and and then not going through that DOD process uh to get it, to get it actually um sanctioned, you know, or right. or, or approved, whatever you want to call it. So I th- yes, I think uh, one of the other reasons to go back to like the bushcraft survival. Why I like Derek so much is that he's like you look at the news today. Like everyone's talking about if the power grid goes down, which seems like it's going to happen any day now. The way they keep talking about it, <laughs> right? And like uh, we like you see all these articles and stuff popping up in the mainstream media. Like hey, you prepared with water, blankets, fire source, knife, each like whatever it is. It's like that's I think that's why we should be like Derek. Like I can't think of the last time I read a. Uh, like a, a book, like a thriller book, where the protagonist is fully seeped in this fuel craft survival. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, some of the military and law enforcement guys have the training the, with, based on you read it. Obviously, you can assume some at that level is going to have some sort of survival training. But right. this guy is so steeped in from how to clean water and make tourniquets with sticks and all that shit there, where it's like it's so, it's just endearing. It's almost like you're, you, you have your pulse on 
what people want to read about. Because it's like, yeah. find a character you can... Would it happen? I don't know. But if it does happen, a lot of the stuff you teach you with like Derek and stuff, it's like, it's very... It would help you today if something were to go bad. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, just, just basic tenets of of survival you know like the uh the rule of three and yeah. um, you know shelter water fire food all all those kind of things those mantras which are at the very basic level but they're in there so there is a modicum of that where people could read the book and be like oh wow okay cool i actually came away learning a couple of things as well which is always great um i i think i was also very fortunate and just i mean I don't know how fortunate you want to call this uh, fortunate, unfortunate uh, in terms of just kind of the climate out there and the way the world is going crazy and everything seems on the brink of um, Armageddon, if you will, you know, so the book is kind of timely in that fashion of like, this is what people are consuming right now. You, you made mention all the survival shows that are out there and yeah. you, there's no, you know, wonder why you're seeing, shows about homesteaders and doomsday preppers yep. and um, survival experts proliferating is because everybody is fascinated with people that can seemingly craft this stuff out of nothing yeah. with just, with just a knife and, and or even just be creative you know. in survival. Yeah. That's what blows me. Away. I mean, and just, just the, the fact of, you know, people can endure. I love alone. Alone is my oh, favorite yeah. one. And on, on yeah. what I see those people can do, but then not only that, but what they can endure in terms of the harshness of their environments and just the, the sheer will to overcome their own minds and, yep. and not, you know, tap out, not hit that button and tap out. So uh, I, I think the book was very timely in that regard uh, in, in that it hit, right at the right time when people were really like interested in this whole survival aspect and whatnot. And it just, it combined, you know, uh, a bunch of other elements of the thriller space, but was also a slightly new take, uh, yeah. especially since, since my antagonists are um, domestic terrorists, you know, the yep. Derek isn't out there fighting North Korea or Russia or, or Iran or anything, you know, not yet. Yeah. I mean, after this, who knows, but, um, but I think that was a, a, another thing that combined with the survival aspect is like, whoa, this story is in our own backyard. And are we that far off from right. this kind of thing happening? You know, so in terms of, I know you, you obviously you, you love writing and reading and all that, but, when it comes to like dealing with like your PTSD and stuff like that from your military career, yep. does this type of writing act as a, as a journaling for you or do you journal? And again, to touch on something like Derek, the fact he showcases in this book, his bouts of PTSD and how it affects him and what he's trying to do. Clearly that is a, I think it's safe to assume it's a direct correlation to someone like you or mm -hmm. actually you through the writing process, trying to deal with your PTSD and put it on paper like Derek's kind of going through. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I don't. I I have journaled, but um, I I usually end up falling back into um, just the creative writing. Um, yeah. But it, there is certainly a cathartic process to it for me. Um, I first when I really manifested symptoms uh you know and i was diagnosed with ptsd like 2007 um and i, I manifested symptoms in the form of like, like these horrible nightmares uh, just just prolonged yeah. highly detailed just vicious things that i would i would wake up screaming every night and um i found that the only way i could cope with them um was to write them down you know so yeah. I would be shaking and everything and, and it would take all of my strength to even get out of bed. Um, but as soon as I could get to a computer, I typed everything that I remembered, uh, which was a lot because they were very vivid. Uh, and then there was, like I said, a catharsis in that, and that if I got it onto paper, it wasn't inside of me. It, it, you know, it might be a small thing, but it wasn't, it was like I had expunged yeah. it somehow and I could, print it out on a piece of paper and put that piece of paper in a drawer and close the drawer. Or I could take that piece of paper and shred it if I wanted to it. And just something in that kind of yep. act of doing that um, was 
kind of the beginning of it. So, uh, so I wrote the chronicle of all those down. Uh, but then more and more as I started working towards stories that are contemporary and uh, occur within our world, I found that the PTSD writing was bleeding out of me a little more in part of my healing process and what yeah. I needed to get to. Uh, and then certainly um, in the run up to the instructor, as we were going through kind of the editing process, uh, I, I kind of came to a realization that, you know, that I'd been struggling with PTSD for, for a decade now, at least, um, and had some, pretty low episodes i was in the particular in a particularly low one right before the instructor went to publication yep and um it was at that point that it dawned on me that i can flip the script a little bit and i don't have to allow my ptsd those symptoms to hold, have a hold over me anymore i'm yep. going to you know, be the commander over it. And I made a resolution to kind of say, I'm going to take what I went through and I'm going to incorporate it into my writing and I'm going to put it out there for consumption, even though it's laying myself there. But that might be the thing that yeah, of course. someone out there needs to hear, you know, someone, someone needs to read and say, wow, this, this guy gets it. You know, he went and got help. Maybe, maybe I should go and do that. You know, if that's the, um, the, the positive that comes out of all the shit that I had to wade through. Yeah. I would do it again in a heartbeat because, you know, the last thing anybody I would want anybody to ever have to do is, is deal with, you know, all those ups and downs, you know? So I, I call it navigating the minefield, right? Like, you I know, if, if, if you, if the engineers clear a minefield for your tank to go through, they're not clearing the entire field. They're yep. clearing a lane through it that you can drive through, right? So picture me as like, I look at it as like, I'm the engineer. I went ahead and stepped on everything, right? But now yeah. there's a there's a path that's cleared behind me. So don't go run off to the right and, <laughs> and try and make it through on your own. Like you've had plenty of us that have gone before you follow our footsteps, save yourself some heartache, you know, and, and don't make the same mistakes that we did. And, and that's really how I've repurposed and repackaged my PTSD it took a long time to get there, you know, and still, still working on it, still, yeah. still healing. But, um, that viewpoint of saying I can, I can take something so negative that had such a negative adverse effect on my life and I can turn it around and use it so that it's a positive for other people. It, it, it takes, it wrestles the control back. You know? Yeah. And that's, well, I think that's why it makes Derek such a great character. Cause he's very, he is, he, he's very human in the sense yeah. of he's dealing with all that. And it's like, it, I, of course, I don't have PTSD, but I know friends that have served in law enforcement and military that have, have it. And it's, they have really bad days, but it's like, when you read a character like Derek, if you don't understand PTSD, you can at least visually see it or mm -hmm. read about it. And if someone like Derek, who, is written by a person who does suffer from PTSD. It kind of puts a, like a face to it. If you don't understand what sure. PTSD really is, I think that's again that's why with Derek, it's like this is a, this is a guy that's mentally fucked up at times. He's physically beat up, yet mm -hmm. here he is still trying to do the right thing and doing the right thing in the midst of all that. It's kind of like a cool like giddy up moment for people that suffer PTSD. Yeah, I, and I think um, uh, the other thing that's articulated with Derek in particular is the broad spectrum of it. Yeah. Um, you know, he, his kind of predominant symptom is, uh, his rage, you know, is, is kind wow. of un uncontrolled anger for no reason, you know, stupid thing like the, sh the salt shaker get knocked over and he loses his mind, you know? Um, and, but there's other things, you know, there's, he, he goes through detachment where he feels numb to everything around him. He goes into, um, fits where he breaks down crying because you know he, he he can't help himself you know it's just you it's not all one thing it's not all just um kind of painted into this corner of oh you have ptsd this is it like no there's a lot of stuff that falls under that umbrella 
And Derek certainly has a large sampling of that. And I think that's eye opening for people yeah. too. like, wait, wait a second. This guy's hysterical crying now. Like, wasn't he just like losing his mind yeah. you know, screaming until the veins popped out of his neck last chapter? I'm like, yeah, sometimes it goes that way, you know? So and it's interesting too, because the idea of survival is you could, you most likely will be on your own. Yeah. The fact this guy has to deal with his mental demons on top of the physical aspect of what's happening. It's such a, just, just a great character, man. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Nice. Yeah. No, I, I really love how he came out. I based him on three guys. Um, one being Rob, who I told you yep. was kind of like my um, blueprint found like um, a foundational from a technical standpoint. You know, he had the uh, the military background and the survival backgrounds so that gives me like a dossier worth of stuff to work through. Um, but then in the good and the bad, I took, you know, the attributes that I admire so much from my father. Uh, who the book is dedicated to, to fill out, you know, Derek just wanting to and and striving to be a good man. Like he he wants to be. It's just he's got these limitations that he's trying to work through. You know, right. his, his ultimate goal is to take care of his son and hopefully maybe get back together with his uh, estranged ex-wife, you know, and so he's trying to do the right thing. Um, and then the, the last bit is all the bad shit, you know, and yeah, I base, I base that off myself, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to say that was anybody else's contribution. Like, no, right. that, that, that's a hundred percent me, but yeah, I, I think I'm very proud of how he came out because, um, one of the biggest compliments I get from readers is, wow, he's so authentic. He's so accessible. That could be anybody. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's, that's, that's what he's meant to be. So, yeah. I love that his background is so like he's just so bottled up, and you you just know this guy would rip your face off, but he's so like reserved too. And like when you see like the bits of anger, it's like oh, you just want to like I could I could picture in an alternate universe where Derek is the ultimate bad guy, where there's oh, a reason yeah, why yeah. he's upset, there's a reason why he's pissed off, and it's believable, and you want to you want to support the villain. Yeah, so that's, that's he, why he's it's, it's awesome. Yeah, I, I, without divulging too much of the story, but. You know, there's a there's a character Gill, um, which which readers will come to love and hate. Um, but it, oftentimes in my head, when I was writing it, I'm like, there's a very thin line between who Gill is and who Derek is. And right. they could easily have been reversed or both working on the same side because just a few things here or there, you know, the, the butterfly flapping its wings in Mongolia kind of yeah. deal. Um, it means all the difference between who is stepping over the line and, and who is maintaining it, you know, and, and uh, that was that was a key element to put in there of, of like, wow, yeah, and this this could be anybody. And given enough of a push, uh, he could be he could be the asshole, too. You know? Yeah, <laughs> this is uh, kind of a two part question. But what do you write every day? And then two. How do you deal with distractions, whether it's home life, social life, PTSD, writing block, uh, d crazy bird watching at your outdoor, doing your outdoor stuff? Like, how do you kind of micromanage all that stuff happening? Um, I, I I don't write every day because I am a uh, I, I still work full time. So uh, ha have my full time nine to five job. Uh, I also have children. So that that's a full time job as well, yeah. you know. And uh, a lot of setting them up for success is through their activities that they do um, and making sure that they're getting to practices and, and, yeah. and games and competitions and whatnot. Um, and my ex and I, we, we pair off very well in getting yeah. that done, but that's always like the top priority. So um, when I was first writing the instructor, yeah, it was an everyday thing, but it was a different set of circumstances. You know, everybody would go to bed and at like eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock, I would sit down and midnight, like bleary eyed, I'm turning the computer off and going to bed. Um, got really bad when I started bringing the laptop with me into bed and I was, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, my ex at the time, she, she would, um, we were married at the time, but she would, she would roll over and hear like the clacking at 3am yeah, and, and, the, and the blue yeah. light. She's like, you go to bed already? Like I can't, I got to finish this chapter. Um, but now it's very much, um, well, I think I, I keep a good, um, good handle from like a discipline standpoint of like okay here's 
here's the deadlines. Here's where it's like a, it's like a feeling out process for me. Uh, I need to get right. this edited by this time. I need to get, so it, I'm working on those schedules and if I feel behind, which I always feel behind, I'll find the time to, to put down words, no matter when it might be, you know? So, um, that is kind of the process now where it's, um, and whatever format it takes, I might be typing notes into my phone. Yeah. Uh, I have, um, journal, um, notebooks scattered about everywhere, you know, so I can just pick them up and, and write that. Um, I have multiple devices that I carry around, you know, or have stationed yeah. throughout the, like I'm on my laptop that I do my primary writing, uh, in my office right now, but across the hall is a Chromebook sitting next to my, my couch. So if I'm watching, you know, the football game, like the Cowboys game yesterday, and it's a blowout, like I'll put it on mute and I'll, I'll start yeah. knocking out words, you know? So it's really more of a, um, whenever wherever kind of approach yeah. for me right now and uh, i don't mind that because i tend to accumulate words pretty quickly when i write like i i, I know a lot of authors are like they're they they write every single day but they might only get like 500 or 600 good words you know that, that's fine that's their process yeah but when i write i can like i crank out if i really get moving i can do like 2200 words in like an hour or two you know yeah. and so i make the most of my time that way because i have kind of that um that ability to to write all that as well right, right. and what was the second part it was the how do i manage distractions yeah and like if I think you I kind of touched on it yeah but... you did no it's, yes it's good what uh how was your transition from military life to civilian life what was that like it was awful <laughs> it's horrible <laughs> You know, that was um, right at the time I got out in 2008. Um, and that was kind of, I would say, right at the time where um, you had a lot of things happening, right? You still had the war, Iraq, Afghanistan yeah. going on. So people were and it was going to go on for a long time past 2008. Um, so so the climate was still around that. And people that, you know, were rotating back and coming, coming home and rotating back. Um but you started to see a lot of the um, war on terror issues for veterans starting to rear their ugly head. Yep. Um, not the least of which was the suicide epidemic. Um, but you had all sorts of other items, you know, readjustment to civilian life, reintegration, joblessness, homelessness, all these things that were coming. And yep. so the military was trying um, very early on to like cultivate a, an exit program for you, but it was, it was, you know, bare bones. It wasn't, it wasn't anything at the time. I don't even know what it's like now. Uh, I would imagine it's got a little more heft to it than it did back then. Um, because for the longest time, the military is like, we don't care what you do after us. Like you're only, this of, is crazy. you know, you're only of use to us while yeah. you're here. You know what, if you want to go off and be a dentist, you know, that's on you go ahead, figure it out. But we're not going to, we're not going to teach you how to reintegrate into civilian life. And it's like, well, you took us out of civilian life and you completely reprogrammed the way we think. Right. And now you're just going to let us, you know, run rampant out there. Like eh, maybe, maybe you should have a little, you know, accountability for that so um i also was all the the kind of the victim not myself but uh, a, a bunch of guys right around that time of just circumstances you know that was when the housing bubble burst uh in 2008 september oh, i think yeah. like september october 2008 i had gotten out in june 2008 and i was in a job and like four months later i'm getting laid off you know so um, that's how I ended up working as a security guard and you know, just cause it's the only job a veteran could get hired for at the time right. I would go into interviews and they'd be like, um, I remember I went into an intelligence analyst interview. I'm a, I'm a qualified military intelligence officer from United States army intelligence school, graduate of intelligence school in the, in the top third of my class. Yeah. And I would go into an Intel analyst uh, on a civilian side and they'd be like, you're not qualified for this. You don't have a master's degree. And I was like, well, they're like, you know, the guy, the three guys in the lobby have, have 
master's degrees in Middle Eastern studies. Why would I, why would I hire you? I'm like, well, have they ever been, have they ever been to the Middle East? Like, and oh, by the way, this Intel job that you're hiring for is an anti-terrorism analyst position. So have those guys with the masters ever been on the receiving end of an IED? Yep. Do they know the, the constant, you know, the current, the current tactics and whatnot? But no, there was an emphasis on things like that of, of, oh, well, you know, you, you shoot it while you, I remember one guy told me, I'm, I'm getting salty now, but I remember one guy telling me, um, w- while you were away, you should have been working on getting your master's those, those four or five years that you were away. And I was like, I wasn't away, you asshole. I was deployed overseas, you know, <laughs> like, I'm like, like, what, what do you mean while I was away? Well, I wasn't at summer camp, man. Right. It, was, it wasn't the circus. You know, what do you think I was doing with my time? Um, so, yeah. So so stuff like that was was particularly difficult because here I am. I was like, I had, right before my second deployment, I had gotten married. And then I deployed a month after we got married. So my whole new, newlywed year was spent in yeah. Iraq. Uh, came home wanted to start a family relocated from long island new york to buffalo new york um then yeah those are not close and then uh um we started a family so we were pregnant at the time and and then all of a sudden i get laid off and it's like you you gotta be kidding me you know so like the world comes crashing down and and now oh hey here's the nice little wrinkle you're you're also diagnosed with PTSD and you're getting triggered by all the stress that you're under right. because you lost your job and you're in danger of losing your home and you've got a baby on the way and it's not just you anymore. You've got to take care of a wife and a kid, yeah. uh, you know, and, and so you start spiraling from all of that. So it was um, an exceptionally difficult transition for me, made worse by the circumstances of the time. Um, I think the military and the VA does a little bit better of a job of addressing it. Yeah. But certainly there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, But as I said earlier, you know, all of that stuff became fuel and was um, able to be repurposed later on for me, you know, which which I'm grateful for. I got to ask, you're the first person I've had out here that's lived and worked inside a tank. Uh, <laughs> I grew up loving watching Kelly's Heroes. Uh, I love the movie Fury. Um, Fury is awesome. But I, I guess the question is: every time I've seen those, uh, outside of like Saving Private Ryan, which I think, or like the percent, like any of those war type movies, that I think the production, I it's pretty realistic. But how often do you watch those movies or shows that depict like tank life, where it kind of like that would never happen, or this dialogue isn't mm. conducive to? I want to believe that the Fury dynamic is close to real life just yeah. because not only do I like the characters, but I felt the dialogue was authentic where there's rough around the edges. There's the pacifist, there's the holy guy, there's the go getter. It's like, can you kind of talk me through like what a daily life inside a tank is really like? Yeah, sure. Um, I love this question too, because like being, being a tanker was just, like it's just, it's just the, like the most badass, most awesome. Yeah. Time, most awesome whatever um <laughs> uh, my grammar isn't the best that's why i have an editor um but yeah fury is a great great example of that i mean what you just described with the different personalities yeah. that's the military in general like it's the melting pot you know people coming from all different areas of the world right. and the country and thrown together in this tiny little you know tin can like back then um because the shermans were they it's not like the main battle tank today like the abrams is it takes a lot to put a dent into the abrams and and back then the shermans um they had the advantage in numbers but in terms of armor and um firepower they they were getting slaughtered by um the panzer tanks and the tiger tiger tanks of of the nazis so um I really love Fury because you get that dynamic of the crew, like your crew really becomes your family within a family because it's, you know, it's not just the 
tank crew of the four people that are operating within that vehicle. But then you also have the other three or four tanks within your tank company, you know, so the company is your, your extended family. And then your tank crew is like your brothers, you know, and, and you really get to be close with those guys, even differences between, one crew in one tank and one crew in another tank because they just do things slightly different but right. um it's um it's it's a tight living <laughs> it's it's not as big i think that was probably my biggest complaint about um courage under fire if you remember oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, i thought it was a good movie um but they made denzel washington's character uh a tank commander in yeah. De- in desert storm um, which where the Abrams tank made its it made its mark on modern warfare, um, and I don't know if you guys remember this, but Sean Aust- uh, Aston Austin who yeah. plays uh, Bilbo, he he was the gunner in that one. Yeah, right? yeah, and 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 I get for Hollywood's purpose, you can't be like filming in an authentic yeah. tank. You need but, Rudy there too, just to really. Well, sell yeah, it. I mean, but but like the amount of space they had in the interior of that tank and courage under fire. I'm like, this is like the Ritz Carlton. Like you, yeah. <laughs> you don't have enough room in there to do all I five here. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> guys, you know, guys, guys, a spot in the back corner, you know, yep. but I mean, in, in the turret itself, you've got three people, tank commander, um, gunner and loader. And then the driver is in a separate compartment up front. But like my knees would be touching the oh. back of my gunner's helmet because the gunner station is right below the tank commander yep. so my my knees would be touching the back of my gunner's helmet right that's how tight everything is and then it can get freezingly cold because um everything's metal so if it's freezing outside you're you're like sleeping in inside of a ice locker like you must like, feel like the vibrations of everything you go sure. over you're feeling everything Sure. Oh, I mean, like you oh. get you if you um if you're going at a high rate of speed because the Abrams can can move a little bit and and you hit something, you're pinballing around in there. Yeah, you, you'll get banged up and bruised everywhere. Just What's your fu- ear protection? Standard military issue? Do you have to? Yeah, you you would have no. You would have um. You're supposed to wear the um 3M earplugs yeah. which, which ended up being faulty or fraudulent anyway Shocker. um you're, you were supposed to wear those did anybody wear those no because then you had your combat crewman um vehicle helmet on and it had headphones just like this so that you were able to communicate both within the intercom system inside the tank uh but then on your radios to company command and battalion command um and I always found like there's a high pitch whine from the um, from the turbine engine, which is right behind me, you know, just through this this metal wall. It's right behind me inside the turret. And I always found between like the high pitch whine of the engine and the vibration that you're feeling inside and, uh, you know, the radio communications, everything. If I put the inner earplugs in. I wouldn't be able to hear shit on the radio. Right. So I, I left them out. Um, but man, oh man, you had better have hearing protection <laughs> if yeah. you were on the outside. And like when we would go to gunnery, which is uh, basically like a gun range for a yeah. tank, we would we would um, fire that main gun and it, it'll make your ancestors rattle. I mean, that is, that is power on... I, on an unprecedented scale that cannon yeah. i mean that, that 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 thing will reach out and touch someone and and really hurt their feelings if you know what i mean so yeah. um so yeah i mean i had a few times where i got caught without my ear protection in and the main gun would go off and your ears are ringing for that was the military like obviously based on your job and your mo and all that but was there like a in your position hey you could only like, be in that position for 40 hours a week or how many times a day? Like, did they try and protect you from that way in sense of all the stuff that could come from doing what you do? I would say so. Yeah. I mean, um, soldiers are stupid, uh, (laughs) to a, to a degree, uh, and officers are, are even more so, you know, to a degree. Um, 
So there are provisions in place, gotcha. But they get ignored, just like anything else. You yeah, know, here, they should get, yeah, get it done. Here, here's what the field manual says: how you should properly mount your tank. Got it. And what do we all do? We all jump off the back of it. You yeah, know, of like and and we're like, ah, we're you know, I'm 22 years old. My knees, you know, I can run five miles no problem. And now yeah. here I am. 42 years old and i've got the body of an 80 year old right. you know? i don't have to wear a shirt inside yeah, here yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i've got arthritis in both hips and i'm like people are looking at me like what's wrong with you i was like i was a tanker you know yeah. like you know you're in a cramped confines of this yeah. tiny little turret and everything um so i will say that yes the the military is is big on those precautions because there's an investment in you right um yeah takes money to train soldiers and yeah. if a soldier gets taken out of the fight i had a um an ied go off on us in iraq and um to my dismay one of my soldiers wasn't wearing his earplugs like we were supposed oh. to because it was all the same stuff that we did where it's like i can't hear the radio so i'm not putting my earplugs in yeah. i was i was guilty of it too and i was the platoon leader but this particular soldier was outside the humvee in a machine gun turret and he didn't have his earplugs in and the IED went off right in front of him and it like ruptured his eardrums. Mm. Um, and now he's taken out of the fight because you know, he's, yeah. he's wounded. He can't hear. Um, and so that pisses the military off. Cause it's like, well, you know, we give you earplugs for a reason. We tell you to do the, we tell you not to jump off the tank because you just tore your ACL and now you're no good to us. You know? Right. So, so yeah, they do do a good job of that. It's it's a self-serving thing for sure. You know, it's not because oh hey, we want to make sure that you're okay when you're 42 that you don't have arthritis yeah, of in course. your hips. It's like no, we want to make sure that your ass can be in that tank fighting for us. You know, I, I get that. That's yeah. what you sign up for. So, and I know you mentioned the close chorus, but w did you ever feel alone in there when you guys were in there all together? No, not not like. I, I would say that every soldier, no matter what, even when they're in um, the company of others, yep. has the at least the capacity to feel alone just in their own mind. You know, where, where, where you just wherever you are, you know, you could be in basic training. You could be in Fort Huachuca, Arizona at Intel School. You could be overseas in Iraq, wherever. Um, you know, you're just going to miss things, you know, you're going to, you miss your, your home, yep. your, your home of record. You're going to miss your first girlfriend, you know, you just, you, so you kind of detach a little bit, but that's the beauty of, um, soldiering. I think that's one of the benefits yep. of soldiering is, is you forge relationships that are going to be there for life. Um, and, and especially when you're in a combat crew, like, in a tank or in an infantry platoon or if you're a, a helicopter like a black hawk crew like you become exceedingly close because you you live and die with those guys. yeah you know when they're sad when they're happy why they're upset and stuff like that 100 100 yeah. so even when you get bad news like your crew can tap into that and they'll yep. send i remember my crew being like LT, you're off today. What's going on? I'm like, yeah, I got some, you know, bad news. Yeah. A, fr a friend. And, you know, so you may not want to have people acknowledge it, but they're going to because you're yeah. all in it together, you know? So, well, if you think about it, if, you, if you're having a bad day, it's like you're in the middle of a situation. It's like you all have to be on the same page here. Yeah. Like, how do yeah. you separate? I, I know athletes and musicians and celebrities, like, hey, what a time to film or sing or, Go out, go out there and pitch. It's like you have to leave everything else behind. But sometimes yep. it's tough to do that because we're, we're only human. So yeah, hundred percent. Combat and... dealing with that in combat or a active shooter situation or stuff like that, where it's like, like this is this is real. Like you have to, if you have a fight with your wife, your kid's sick, your car troubles, your parents just passed away, and it's like yeah. you're still in this moment where you can't let that stuff bother you. And I, I think people that deal with that at this level or any level really it's super impressive to me how you're able to kind of like micromanage those, those type of emotions. Yeah. And you have, you have to cultivate that. Um, certainly as a leader, you know, being, yeah. being a young second Lieutenant with a, a platoon going out into the streets of Baghdad every day. Um, 
I had to be well in tuned into yeah. not not my just the personalities as they exist in an everyday sense of like okay who's my slacker who's my jokester who's who's my reliable guy that I can turn to um if if need be but realizing when those personalities are off you know so hey what's what's with um what's with Simon today? You know, yeah. like he, he's usually busting chops and today he's all sullen. Like let's pull him aside and talk to him a little bit. Um, because there's a little of that. I, I want to say self-serving, but not in a negative connotation. It's just kind of what you said, like we're all relying on one yeah. another, you know? So if somebody's off, they may say, Hey, don't bother me. It was like, Oh, well, we, we got to bother you. Cause we got to know that you're, you're going to be able to handle what, what's going on. And if you're not, let's figure it out, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's definitely a attribute that gets cultivated within the military just through training aspects, but also just in those close confines of spending every waking moment with, with your soldiers, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it becomes your family in that time, you know, and, and then, uh, it usually stays your family for, for a long time as well. Right. I know uh, with the instructor, I got it off Amazon. Yep. Uh, if, if you want to direct people to grab a book, is Amazon the best spot, your website, anywhere else? Yeah. Don't go through um, my, my website because uh, I don't sell them directly. Um, I'm, I'm not a good person with math <laughs> or accounting or business. Um, I, I, there, there was um, many reasons why I wanted to go traditional publishing. Um, not the least of which was having uh, people be able to do the business side of selling the books. So, so definitely don't look at me. I just write the things, um, but you can go anywhere to like, you can go to Macmillan um, publishing yep. and order it directly from the publisher all the big retailers, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble yep. Books a Million, um, even some of the big retail chains like Walmart and Target, they don't carry it in stores, but you can order it through, it. through them. Um, but then don't forget your independent bookstores. Uh, they, they have all the connections to the um, the product lines and yeah. they can they can organize it too. And I, I always love shouting out those independent bookstores because they're really like the lifeblood oh the bottom uh, pop stuff even the libraries that still have access yep. to actual yeah, open libraries, libraries and stuff awesome and so you know you can get the audiobook um as well audiobook e-reader um do you do so, in stores at all if people do you ever go to like stores inside books? oh i love that yeah okay, i'll, I'll awesome. do i'll do signings um i just did one over uh the christmas holiday yep. up in uh connecticut with a couple other author friends, which was a nice one. Um, working on a couple now because the sequel comes out in April. Um, the, the Infiltrator comes out April 23rd. The cover looks awesome. Yeah, the cover came out good. Um, we, we, we definitely... Rad. We, we did take... That's a particular scene right in the middle of the book. And I like uh, that the colors... It's not... Obviously, with like the instructor, it's very dark and broody. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that one's so light. It's like it kind of it's like cool, like just position there. Yeah, I I I took note of that as well, and how you know it was what much more bright, and uh, again because I'm the author and I and I know yeah, what course. comes after that. I'm like it's it's so bright, but but it gets so dark. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's like knowing what's coming. Um, hey, can people pre-order that book already? Yeah, that that is out. So same place, all the yep. um, major retailers. Uh, you can go on my socials too, and yep. I, I have links to um, the pre-orders on my socials. Uh, the only one that's a different handle is my my Twitter. My my X is. Um, tr underscore hendrix because i had a, a twitter account well before i became oh, yeah. an author so i had to kind of live with that <laughs> like, one. who is this guy yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i had to re i had to readjust it and everything but everything else um for the most part yeah so i'm on insta threads tiktok and i think it's just that just it but those three are at read R E A D T R Hendrix. Love it. Um, and I have links in all my my profiles and stuff to take to the pre order for 
for the infiltrator as well. Um, no, and, uh... and we'll be doing some, we'll be doing some events. I'm working with the publisher, um, Good. the publicity department right now. Um, we're, we're lining up a couple of signing events and whatnot to do. And I, I always kind of like, I was just in a bookstore yesterday um, and I poked my head in. I'm like, Hey, I got a book coming out in April. Are you interested in doing anything? I'm like, yeah, sure. So you oh, know, that's great. So yeah, anytime, uh, hell, I just pop into a Barnes and Noble. And if I happen to see a book on the shelf, I'll go over to the manager. I'm like, Hey, that's mine. You mind if I, if I go sign it? And usually, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're very accommodating to that kind of thing. They look over, you sign the entire row of Daniel Steele novels. And like, <laughs> <"Who's> this guy. <laughs> Uh, I've heard I it never happened to me. I've always had um store managers and and workers be very gracious uh and and dare I say even excited when you say hey That's I'm great. I wrote this book would you mind and like in Barnes and Noble in particular they have little stickers that say signed yeah. edition and they'll take pictures of you signing it and they'll throw it up on their on their social for the particular store which is always fun great to do but I have heard from other authors where they get some surly worker, you know, who has who, no idea, like even what who, you're asking, or be like, that would be defacing property yeah. or something. Like, well, I'm the author. I wrote this book. Well, it doesn't belong to you. You, you know, it's graffiti. Right. <laughs> okay. might, be in the, might be in the wrong business there, you know. But, um, but yeah, I, I try to do that as much as I can. Well, uh, this has been great, Tim. Uh, yeah, it's great. Everyone that reads the. Uh, the 50 people the book club they're going to read the book and get the nice. sequel and everything after that so uh yeah thank you for the time today thank you for your service and uh good luck with the rest of your writing career appreciate it appreciate it. oh one last thing uh the 23rd january 23rd i don't know yeah. if this will air before or after that but uh instructor on paperback as well um on january 23rd so. love it parting notes awesome. there <laughs> all right thank you sir thank you appreciate it yep bye oh hello I'm just enjoying this nice fucking pier hammer. Anyways, I'm John, the host of Spear Talk, and I want to talk to you about nice fucking candles. We are lucky to have nice fucking candles as a sponsor of the podcast, and if you use code SPEARTALK15, you get 15% off your first order, or use the affiliate link below to always get your candle needs through nice fucking candles. Nice fucking candles are 100% soy wax. They have a 65-hour burn time, maybe more, if you, uh nurse the flame a little bit maybe i don't know i'm not an expert in flames uh, or candles but i will say these things burn a long fucking time you ask me about the wick it's a double wick for even burning which is amazing and uh they come with three incredible flavors uh i'm not sure if you're going to be eating these candles but if you do like them this scent are eucalyptus and ginseng tobacco and fireside and seaside and driftwood once again uh nice fucking candles they are the candle company to spear talk and if you love candles and need a good scent to clear out your office, your room, your podcast room, your weight room, uh, your whatever you're doing in a room that smells like crap, use this candle. It's amazing. Thank you. Check them out. Love nice fucking candles.